be back on the estate tomorrow night when Karen finds out if Sharon's half-sister is also Barry's long-lost brother and Harry comes face to face with the devastating loss of his hairline. That's the estate tomorrow at 8.30. But before we go live to Eamon and the gang, there's just time to look forward to what's coming up later tonight on Channel One. At 9.30, we have an in-depth documentary about the downfall of Jacob Hamilton Mann, which forced this year's early election. That's The Night Visitor at 9.30, poorly narrated by Patrick Bannon. At 10.30, Adrian Atkinson Blimey is here for a special episode of Incisors, where he sinks his teeth into the current cost of living crisis by interviewing a multimillionaire, a nurse and a bin man to see who is suffering the worst. Here's a clue. It's not the millionaire. At 11.30, fasten your no, seatbelts. No, not four of them. And her. Like a fucking intervention. We're worried about you, Eamon. I mean, honestly, you have a couple of little episodes on live TV and... What's that? Really? Five of them? Jesus, that is a lot. Anyway, where does she get off judging me? You know, she goes out, gets drunk every night, brings a different fella home. She doesn't even ask their names and I'm unstable. Do you know what they sing about her around town? Eve is worth a punt with her flappy little... Yep, standing by. Good evening, I'm Eamon Tightly. Tonight, behind me is a true TV legend. Now running for Prime Minister, everyone's handiest man, Peter Clement. Now, Peter thinks he's here tonight to film a special reunion episode of Just the Job, but as always, viewers, you know better. 10 seconds, places. It's time. Let's start the show. In five, four, three, Cracking stuff. Good evening, friends. And yes, it's true, I can hardly really believe it myself. But we are back for this special one-off reunion episode of Just The Job. And to be clear, it's the show that you remember with me good old sidekick, little Jimmy Chisel, some top tips on how to improve your DIY and, of course, some special surprise guests from Just The Jobs in Hello. Austria. Hello. My name is Dave and I'm an alcoholic. Hello, Dave. My name's Eric and I'm a floor manager. No, I prefer my hobby. No, Some nights, nice, so would I. Don't give up, Eric. We're only getting started on this one. So let's Oi. get tonight's show kicked off with a slightly scance look at Stand the mighty memo. And go, Eamon. Because you will be right at their place. Place. Oh, come on. Oh, you are. God, it's you. <laughs> yeah, it uh, <laughs> certainly is me. You <laughs> naughty, naughty little fuckers. <laughs> Sorry. Peter. Hey, Frank, did you know about this? <laughs> Ah, oh, look at that face. Got you fucking did. You cheeky fuckers. Peter, you thought you were here tonight to film a special reunion episode of Just the Job. I, I can't believe this. I can't. But tonight, Peter Clement, these are the bits of your life. Oh. <laughs> happy. Let's get you to the studio. I'm going to fucking have you, fuckers. <laughs> Emma, I can't bloody do so. Look at that. All the way along. They're all fun. This way, Peter, am I just deaf? I don't know. I can't believe you. Honestly, I'm, I'm a huge fan of your show. Right, I'm back. Of course. Deja vu, mate. Yeah. Oh, now I'm getting deja vu about talking about deja vu. Double deja. Is that a thing? I don't know. Is it? I think so. I think I had it back then. And now? No. I've never had this conversation before. I doubt anyone has. It does seem on. Um, 
much. Got to go. Beamer's here. Thank Have a good so show. Much. Double engagement. Trademarking that. Have your vote. So, Eamon, how long have you been uh, planning this, Eamon? Eamon, how long have you been planning, Eamon? Eamon? Peter Gordon Clement, you were born October 10th, 1923, in the northern town of Rothering, to Fanny and Martin Clement. Oh, Peter, what have we let ourselves in for? That's right, they get up at the crack of dawn to take the trip down to the capital by coach. It's your infamous old man and her long-suffering husband, Fanny and Martin Clement. Julia Salisbury. You hear his mother? No. Let's see. All right, come on then. They brought me on early. Look on the bright side, you get to the pub quicker that way. I wish. I've got to get back to campaign HQ. Uh, the phones will be ringing off the hook tonight. Oh, and, um, and if I may, Eamon, uh, viewers can call advance with any questions after the show on capital 34156. You've got to write that telephone number down. I like a yeah, prank great. call. Sit down. Uh, so, what was life like for young Peter growing up in the Clement House? Well, uh, well, obviously I wasn't there, but... but um, but I'd imagine that there, there were a lot of similarities between the, uh, the child, Peter Clement, and the man sat before you tonight, Eamon. Uh, uh, just like the adult Peter, I, I'd imagine that the, the five-year-old version was, uh, was headstrong, charming, and a lot more coherent before 8pm. Not entirely sure what this path is supposed to be about. Uh, actually, that's, that's rather good. Who are you? I'm Julia Salisbury. Uh, Peter and I are running for Prime Minister. Oh, that explains it. Yeah, yeah, I think I've seen your face on a bus stop. Plausible. <laughs> Julia Blueberry, everybody! Very <laughs> close to the election. I don't worry about it. You wouldn't recognise any of the other candidates either. He only reads articles about himself. <laughs> In 1938, you were a 15-year-old at Rothering Elementary, but already you had quite the reputation as a ladies' man. Who's this, Peter? Who's running this show? Oh, Christ, it's... <laughs> Dorothy Hanneman. You called me at the wrong time. You came here with an excuse for a cruise ship entertainer. <laughs> oh, please stop looking, Eamon. My arse is quite clean enough. Got it. Here's one finger for the north and two fingers to the south, and we can all apologize tomorrow. <laughs> Let's tally another drink. It's been a very difficult day. I wish I'd never bought that mobile phone. Ah, they'll never catch on. Who wants the phone going off when you're having a quiet pint? Yes, that's what they said about television too. Uh, so, Dorothy, uh, let me ask you. Uh, what do you think we could see in Peter way back then that could have predicted his path to household name and now aspiring Prime Minister? Eamon? Yes, Mrs Hammerman. Well, that question is clearly not meant for me, is it? Well, think about it, Eamon. When Peter was a child in Rothering, what was I? What was I? Also a child? I wasn't even a fucking fetus, you idiot! Uh, yes, uh, of course, yes. So yes. why did you ask me that question? Uh, well, I have to stick to the script. Pardon? 
I have to stick to the script. My therapist. Your what? Ah, uh, it doesn't matter. Oh, just grow a bloody spine, man! You're lucky you don't work at three. I would send you to a fucking boot camp! <sighs> Dorothy Hammerman, everyone! <laughs> oh, time to call a guest. <laughs> I don't suppose you feel like taking me with you, do you? Darling. You interviewed the Archbishop of Pendleshire after 12 pints and more than a few whiskey chasers. You know my rule, sweetie. Just keep taking the medicine. And to either it starts to help. Or you no longer need it. <laughs> hey, Eric. Don't think I didn't see you there. Oh, shit. Well, before we bring our next guest on, let's look at a classic clip from Just the Job. It's on that monitor there. Peter, if you'd like to watch. And that's about two minutes. Right, I'm going to have a look at that monitor. I've no idea what clip you're going to play. Lovely, Danny Hatch. <sighs> Interesting choice. I'll drink to that. Uh, <laughs> Yep, bombs yep. up. Yeah, why not? Got to keep the old grey matter lubricated after all. Can we reset, please? Well, it's time for a segment that the papers have called explosive and the brutes have called inadvisable, reckless and puerile. It's our drink to that. Now, I want to say up front that our floor manager, Frank, advised us against... I definitely did advise against doing this. Peter right, I'm not going to argue with you, Eric, but we are definitely fucked here. It's just a question of how badly fucked are we? I mean, are we talking tickling us with the tip or crushing prostates? You should have been a poet. By the time Hammerman's finished with us, we won't be able to hold a pen. I don't think she was actually angry with us. Apparently she got a phone call in the first slot and we're just collateral damage. Uh, I can't work with a poet, Eric. Ten seconds, everybody. I don't know any rhymes. OK, going in five, four, three... Fantastic memories there from one of the nation's most beloved TV shows. Now, Just the Job had two successful runs, of course, from 58 to 64 and again from 1972 to 1976. And Peter, across many, many of those shows, there was always one man by your side. To me up. And that's not him. Can I not just do me own line up? Nah, it's too late. What's your name, darling? Chelsea Bonds. <laughs> yes. Oh, that's your actual name. OK. Uh, Chelsea Bonds, everybody! <laughs> oh, no, I forgot the jiggy bit. Oh, I'm coming! Wait up, wait for me, I'm coming. Oh. I'll, um... <clears throat> oh. Chelsea, how are you, pet? Oh. Pretty love. Oh, you've not aged a job. Try telling that to me, bloody. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh. Take a seat there oh. now. <laughs> well, uh, Chelsea, you're certainly in a position to give us a unique insight into this bit of Peter's life. Well, to be honest, love, I'm not. But as I'm here and I'm on telly, I'll give it a go. Fire away. <laughs> right. Uh, what are the differences, would you say, between the on-screen and off-screen versions of Peter Clement? Oh, well, I'd like to think that the off-screen version is a lot more sober. Well, you'd be surprised, love. Everybody likes a drink in this game, or worse. But I've never got mixed up in drugs. And as me old man used to say, what looks like chocolate often turns out to be sculpted <laughs> shite. <laughs> ah, yes, yeah, we've got a little bit of archive footage here which shows us exactly what you're talking about there. Um, let's have a look at that. Oh, God. OK, LJ, let's take a look at one of our viewers' letters. Right, you are, boss. This first one's from... This can't be right. Give me that. This letter is from... Oh. See? This letter is from Dick Cockley. Dick Cockley? Who comes from... Oh, fuck off. Let me. Dick Cockley from Little Muff on the Green. He says... It's not a real place, is it? Fuck those. I know we shouldn't have had those chases, though. He says... Don't look at me, you'll set me off. He says that? No, shut up. He says... Dear Peter... I'm having terrible trouble with your knob. It's so small I can't even use it. 
he's, I, I think he's talking about a doorknob, ladies and gents. I wouldn't be so sure. Listen to this. Oh, God. I've tried to get a bigger one, but all the shops have run out of big knobs. All they've got left is tiny little knobs, even smaller than mine. Poor bastard. Yeah, I'm too pissed for this. Bloody lightweight. <clears throat> The other day, I needed to get into the bathroom in a hurry, but I couldn't get a grip on the tiny knob. I've got, I got so angry that I kicked the knob with all my might and it went straight through the wood. So now my knob is stuck inside the door. You don't need our help, mate. You need a doctor. I don't have a big enough tool to get it out. Can just the job. Please send one of your fellas over with one of their big tools to try and fish out my little knob. For Christ's sake, did you write this, Frank? It's real. It's real. Oh, Christ. I'm so sorry, Dick. Dick Cockley. <laughs> Just get to the end. OK, I'm nearly there. <clears throat> Otherwise, Peter, I'm afraid my knob might be lost forever. <laughs> So great to see you last. None of the old spark there. God, I remember that. We were three sheets to the wind. You should get Jimmy out here to talk about this. Actually, that was the plan. <laughs> well, I used to watch ba Just the Job back in the day. Oh, yes. You see, I used to work in the city, and my boss, he bought me a colour telly. You don't need to know the details. But it meant I could watch Just the Job whenever I could. I were that excited. <laughs> I used to tell the old world and his mother, see him, see him. I know him. <laughs> oh, Petey, love, I was so proud to have known you. Oh, and also so sad to have lost your love. I mean, I know it were only a few months, and let's face it, we were so bloody young, but, you know, you were... No, you still are the nicest, kindest, most attentive bloke I've ever been with. <laughs> and I'll tell you something else for now. You were the only man who used to make me... Steady <laughs> now! <laughs> and without you, I would never have discovered the reliable pleasures of the black and tan! First girl I ever knew to drink a pint. Oh, whatever happened to us, eh? You did, Peter Love. You and the black and tans. Yeah. I remember. I remember. Sorry, Charles. Ah, you're all right, Petey. I forgave you years ago. You were weak and easily led. And let's be honest, once you had a fucking drink inside you, you were a sucker for a pretty face. It was like you had this insatiable need to be loved. Like you had something to prove to the entire fucking world. More likely, yourself. Chelsea Bonds, everybody! <laughs> Thank you for agreeing to do this. I just wanted to see your eyes again. They're not the same, Peter. You lost me. In 1941, long before Just a Job ever aired, you, like so many men of your generation, were conscripted into the army to go and fight on the continent, and it was on those very battlefields that the strangest of friendships was born. Of course, I was only a kid during the war, so my main memory is of being with a nice family in Chintlebury. It's not your best friend of the last 40 years, but actually, could be worse. It's little Jimmy Chisholm! <laughs> <laughs> right, uh, yeah, let's go. <sighs> Mr. Cockley, I presume. You can call me Dick. Come <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Take a seat there. Oh. So, tell us, what's it like to be friends with Peter Clement? Oh, you know, Eamon. I was sitting back there watching all the footage on the monitors and I was thinking, well, despite all the injuries from his constant drunken pranks, yeah, it was still one of the best bits of my life. Yeah, we never really were friends, though, were we, LJ? Oh, I'll go by Jim now, mate. 
Right you are. You see, Jim here can hold his drink. There's nothing lightweight about him. We put whiskey in his coffee, vodka in his squash. Just seemed to give the show a bit more of an edge of unpredictability. Oh, and kept the Red Cross on their toes, too, from time to time. <laughs> God, that were awful to you, man. A lesser man would have walked out. And maybe a less desperate one. Yeah. Well, I know it might seem backward, but we used to drink to ease the repetitive boredom of the same old success. And you know, Eamon, as me old man used to say, you can even get tired of Quim. If it's the only dish on the menu. <laughs> <laughs> Little Jimmy Chessel, everybody. <laughs> Sorry about that, mate. Oh. No, that weren't your fault. No, I kept my distance, if I'm being honest. I've been so angry with you for all these years now, Pete. I'm glad I did this. I think I needed to. See you for a pint after. Indubitably, Mr Cockley. <laughs> <laughs> well, it wasn't only just the job, Peter, that brought you into the nation's homes. Starting in 1977 and running every week night for nearly seven years, you brought that inimitable Peter Clement style to your eponymously named late night chat show, Petey. Let's have a look at a classic clip now. And a couple of minutes back. Same as before. Sure is. You okay, Eamon? Am I drunk, Eric? Don't think so. Must be the show, then. The show must be drunk, Eric. Maybe I'll get it a coffee. Uh, I think we're past that point. Yeah, there's a drink. Penny for him. If you were a pop star, Eric, mm. A genuine cocaine groupies on the tour bus level pop star. Mm. Would you give it all up to be a priest? Oh, I don't know. It's probably as crazy as giving up a five night a week chat show to become a politician. Ha! <laughs> I'll drink to that. Hey. Oh, no thanks, I still need my job. Can we reset, please? Well, how drunk is he? Well, we drank half a bottle of Pakistani Special Reserve, whatever that is. Oh, that may help us. Please, Eamon, just go with the flow. Ten seconds, everybody. You go with the feckin' flow. I'm sticking to the script. <sighs> Going in five, four, three, two. Unforgettable stuff. Unforgettable but, Peter, while you took all the credit, arguably someone else did all the work, didn't they now? Who's this? <laughs> Peter Clement, I'm coming for you. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it's, well, it's someone foreign. <laughs> oh no, now we have to finish it. <laughs> Drink. In glorious Afghanistan, people fight to death for a single shot of this. Uh, it's a very popular television program. Tonight, you speak from bottle. Yep, that's it. I think we can it. safely say we've got him drunk. Yes, the race of us jumped and cried. That is 60%. <laughs> right, uh, right, what happened here? Yeah, sorry, Eamon. Oh, yeah, he spit on chair uh, like a village prostitute at annual feast of Bukake. <laughs> Uh, right, fine, we'll do the interview standing up. Eric, could you? Already on it. Oh, yes, we stand for interview. And then we drink like we march to certain death tomorrow. <laughs> like in war, yes? Try again. Only this time, like you have bowls of bull and not penis of flea. He's having a drink. Ah, uh, now you fit to execute dissidents. Amen. Ah, uh, no, no, thank you. Uh, drink, Spangly Man. Uh, no, no, you see, I have a very low tolerance to that sort of thing. Either you drink with me, or I send special Erkistani Black Ops unit to your home, and they kill you and all your family. <sighs> Just the one, then. <laughs> Oh. <sighs>
What a glorious Pakistan! Have we killed him? <laughs> no? Right, well, let's get this sorted out. Eric, is Jim still here? They're all still here waiting for the finale. But get him out then. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, and sorry for the unforeseen circumstances. Stick with us, and we will get this back on track. Uh, it's like man who tried to set fire to a house for insurance and end up burning down whole village. Not helping, mate. I'm not trying to. <laughs> what do you need? These are his cue cards. You are host. Right, you are, PC. Thanks, El. Thank you, Jim. <laughs> and that's thanks to Dorothy. No, that's not right. It's thanks to Ivan Bonovich. Come on, Ivan, this way, mate. Yes, this way. Maybe I, I, I lie down into the window. Good idea. You need to be ready for the finale. One problem <laughs> at a time, Eric. Right, you go to the podium. I'll get Ivan off. Come on, mate, this. Go on for the song. Oh, yes, wait. Yes, we sing of the old times in the forest uh, and the future of glorious Erkistan. Yes. Land of my fathers, land where man is man. On what to slaughter for glorious Erkistan, where the penis is a large and we think of the glory as our two mess and tails. <sighs> oh, are you sick now? And that brings us to last year, when you surprised the whole country by announcing that you're forming a new political party. And as the last bit of your life is always the future... Son, it's time we had a talk. Well, I know that voice. It's your old man myself and I assume your father. Please welcome Martin and Fanny Clement. <laughs> It's just me, love. Martin's asleep in that holding area. Still, one's enough to conjure some spunk, as they say on the wards. Jim Petal, nice to see you. And you too, Mrs Clement. Oh, call me Fanny, love. We're way past formality. After all, as they say in the Navy, no point in brushing your teeth when you've already swallowed me up. <laughs> this way, pet. Yeah, I'll put that in for you. Hello. Hello. Oh. Sorry about your pa. He's had one too many and I didn't see any point in waking him up. No, I'm right, Mum. I think you heard you in a little bit earlier. We have been waiting a while, pet, yes. Now, love, this isn't easy, but there's something I want to talk about. Oh, uh, what's that then? We need to talk about your drinking. Right, now I know what to call this That's path. Right, pet. Look at the state of things. Everybody drinks in show business, ma'am. They love it when I'm drunk. I'm not hurting anyone. OK. I didn't want to do this, but as they say in prison, if they won't open their mouths, you'll just have to use the shunt. You there, come here. Could you get everyone out here, Pet? Um, yes, we, we planned that uh, for the song after the debate. Well, can you bring them out now instead? Um, uh, yes, OK. And uh, while we wait, perhaps you could tell us a story from Martin, uh, from Peter's childhood. OK. Right. This is a story from a long time ago. Probably even before Peter can remember. We were four, maybe five years old. And you were playing out in the back garden. His dad were on the prowl. He were always on the prowl. Yes, but this isn't about him. This is about you. Anyway, you hadn't been out there long when all of a sudden you came rushing in, all covered in blood. And you were holding something in your hands. It were a bird, a pigeon. You said you'd seen it all roughed up by neighbour's cat and you were holding it out to me like I was some sort of vet. So we got a shoebox and you made a bed for it out of leaves and grass from garden. Why don't I remember this? And you refused to go to school. You just spent the days tending your bird, feeding it with your fingers, talking to it. You even sang to it once, if I remember rightly. But in spite of all you did, on the fourth morning you woke up and bird were dead. 
You were inconsolable, pet. No matter what I did, you would not stop crying for weeks. But something about it weren't sitting right. You were feeling guilty, but it weren't your fault. Eventually, you cracked and told me the truth. There weren't no cat. You'd been angry with your dad and you'd kicked your football, meaning to smash a window, and you'd hit the bird. It weren't your fault, but well... Oh, God, I remember. There were feathers everywhere. So, we held a little ceremony and we buried it in the back garden. And you gave a little speech. You said you would never hurt anything ever again. You would always help. You said that were a Peter Clement promise. First time you'd use that phrase. And you meant it, pet, became your life. Never hurt, always help. But I'm looking at these people here, these bits of your life, people you've hurt. There's the ex-girlfriend you cheated on, the colleague you bullied, and your new friend here, the one who says you're only good before eight o'clock. And as for the rest of them, your drinking pals, two of them are passed out backstage and the last one's stormed off to a wine bar. What's your point, Ma? Chelsea Pet. How did you feel when you found our Petey in bed with Victoria? Oh, God, that were years ago. Come on. Tell her the story. Tell her the story. Oh, um... <clears throat> well, I spent the afternoon with Jan Sandwich, you know, uh, Victoria's sister, and, and I bought Petey here a present. So I went to look for him in his secret hiding place under the stage. Only when I got there, like it did, giggling and bottles clinking. Don't know why I kept on walking. I knew what was going on. I guess I just had to see it for myself, you know, with my own eyes. Oh, God. A pair of you were half naked, wrapped up in your tatty, bloody sleeping bag. God knows how much you'd had. At one point, your head just lolled backwards and it was like you were seen beyond me. You were that far gone, it was like I were sodding invisible. I didn't mean for it to happen, Chelsea. It was just one of those things. Yeah, like when Jimmy lost part of his foot. Oh, come on, Jim, that was just PT, a you are a treasure, Pep, but treasure. when you drink, you hurt people. And, and, and the more they love you, sorry, love, but the more you love, they love you, the deeper you hurt them. You're going to be Prime Minister, pet, but if you don't stop, if you don't change, you'll forget things, you'll miss things. And this lovely lady here, tell us about Huntledon, please. Well, uh, um, you saw it on the news, I'm sure. Tell us how it was for you. It was, um, well, as you all saw, uh, Peter was slurring slightly and the invective was, shall we say, flowing freely. And Peter called an audience member a, uh, well, you, you all know what word he used. Ah, we do that. It was couldn't, wasn't it? Yes, it was. And that's not really what politicians are supposed to do. Didn't hurt us in the polls, though. No. That's the amazing thing. Nothing Peter does seems to hurt us in the polling. But um, I was watching a young activist in the crowd. I, I like to watch the crowd at these things, get some instant feedback. And, uh, and she was looking up at Peter on the stage when you were talking, well, ranting by this point. And when you said that word, a light went off in her eyes. I saw it happen. And, and she looked at the floor and then she turned and pushed her way through the crowds. And that young woman will never vote for us. 
and it's not because of what Peter was saying, that the point he was making was really good. It was just the words the drink chose to use. That's what scared me. What are you most afraid of, Pat? I'm scared of two things. I'm scared that... Sorry, Peter. But I'm scared that you'll drink yourself to death. And I'm scared that it will cost us the election. And as a result, millions of people we could have helped. You only hurt people when you drink, Petey. But after the election, when you run in the country, how many more people will get hurt because you took your eye off the ball and onto a bottle? I don't know. What to say, ma'am? Who here thinks things would be better if our Petey gave up the booze? Of course. Sorry, ma'am, yes. but she's right. I mean, well, obviously, I think Peter is a suitable Not candidate. Not now, Pet. Just answer. Sorry. Then, um, yes. Do you understand, Petey? Yes, ma'am. Sorry, Charles. Jim. Sorry, Julie. Everyone. Don't be sorry, Petey. Be better. Say you'll change. Look your old man in the eyes and promise me. I want to. But I don't know how. You can't do it alone. It's impossible. But you're not alone, are you? No, ma. Good. Come and give your mother a hug. When you're feeling sleepy, that you just keep crying out, Ma's got juice the jaw. When it's overwhelming and there's nobody about, Ma's got juice the jaw. Troubles come like sunsets every single day. Men stand and fight with them. If cowards run away, but if you've made things better, when your time has gone to stay, then that's just the job. And we're out. Slow and steady wins the race. He's such a sweetie when he's on your TV. It's such a treat when.